Feast is a 2005 American action horror comedy film directed by John Gulliger, starring Balthazar Getty, Henry Rollins, Navi Rawat, Judah Friedlander, Josh Zuckerman, Jason Mewes, Jenny Wade, Krista Allen, and Clue Gulliger, as well as a bunch of horny ass aliens. The monsters are doing it doggy style. Coleman! What's up? Oh my god, it's uh, it's like you snuck up on me. I thought you were dead and and then you it, it must be the Halloween season because you just scared the shit out of me. Tonight we're we're talking about a spooky movie kind of <laughs> it's actually <laughs> It's so scary, it's John. So so spooky and and sweaty and horny. This is like if Michael <laughs> Bay directed a porno. Damn, baby. Act like you feel it. Ah! Quite the film. It's one of those films that I heard about and it had like quite a reputation and I was just like, yeah, I'll get to it. It didn't sound too appealing, but I was just like, man, I, I've just kind of like blown through a bunch of shit. And, and, and uh, instead of going to like a, a go-to for, for this Halloween season, I decided to to jump Halloween and go right to Thanksgiving and, and talk about a feast. Coleman, have you ta have you seen Feast before I made you watch this? No, I had not seen Feast, and I was just going to say the only reason I have seen Feast is because you made me watch it. <laughs> Did I like it? Did I not? I don't know. Mm. We'll get into that. It's uh it's a movie. It's a mo it's something. It sure is something. Is it getting better? Yeah, it looks pretty good. Okay. Jump into kind of the background real quick. Just the fact that this exists at all is, is is interesting because back in the early 2000s, there was a show called Project Greenlight, and that was ran by Ben Affleck and Matt Damon. We'll be returning to HBO with Project Greenlight. Clearly, we haven't had any new ideas in the intervening 13 years. Not a fresh idea. It was their attempt to kind of give back to the independent filmmaker because of their success that they found with Goodwill Hunting. And so it was like the shark tank of movies. So a bunch of different filmmakers would write scripts and do all this and submit. And then at the end of each season, because this was like a multi-season show, the two would, would pick a winner and Feast from John Gulliger is actually the season three winner of Project Greenlight. So this is the this is the script. We came up with a, a pretty cool little like, f and uh, and so uh, in, in in the uh, in, immortal words of my dad Clue, um, uh, to all the naysayers, uh, you know, f you all. Oh wow! He <laughs> yeah. just didn't win awards, but won getting made. Uh, congratulations, <laughs> whoever. John Gulliger. Yeah. This film is so many things, but one thing it isn't is it doesn't feel super cheap. And that's what's shocking because the premise is just so trashy and unoriginal. But then, like, the way it's shot and the effects and everything, it looks like it has some money. And that's why. It's because... Ben Affleck and, and Matt Damon were executive producers on this. Wes Craven was also a producer on this. And this also had Vegas money to it. The Maloofs were behind this. All of the Maloof family <laughs> funded this. I didn't even know there was a Maloof motion pictures. I never want to be in that casting couch, let me tell you. They put $3 million into Feast. Uh, guess how much, just without cheating or looking at anything, Coleman, how much did you, do you think this movie made at the box office? I'm going to guess $7. <laughs> uh, plus 651000 uh, give or take. Okay. Yeah. Not where you want to be on a return investment on $3.2 million, though. No, not at all. <laughs> I was I was just going for the lowest bet, like the Price is Right, mm -hmm. hoping that I'd win. Sure, and I probably I probably still would have won with the cast and the and the way it's shot. It it does have some. It is technically sound as much as a film like this could be. It opens up with a very stylized shot where it goes like the the smaller millimeter camera. It is very stylized. It's got it's got a soundtrack. It's got you know like 
the the old school like white trash new metal of, of the early 2000s so there was money thrown around it was distributed by dimension films it was just like i i, I just don't think it was enough to really entice and, and again i didn't know that this film even existed until years down the road i had zero idea in 2005 that this was even a movie did you even hear of this back then no, I'd never heard of this until you brought it up to me. Okay. And I had heard of Project Greenlight, but I was not familiar with what it was. Mm -hmm. But it's it's similar to that, eh, a little bit, to that uh, idea that uh, Joseph Gordon-Levitt mm -hmm. has now with the people sharing and helping. The and, hit record, yeah. Yeah. And the, the thing that I did hear about is a lot of the actors in here, because no, it's no... It's no A-listers, but it's really fun, not even character actors, just, like, cool, like, decisions. Because Balthazar Getty is a is a David Lynch guy right. from Lost Highway. You have Henry Rollins, the best spoken word stand-up guy. Okay, if you are in front of eighteen to 20,000 Iron Maiden fans, the upside is they only want to see one band. The downside is you are not in that band. Oh my god, I could already see that I did this with the wrong person. <laughs> Jason Muse as himself? Can I get an amen on that? Amen. Okay. <laughs> it is funny because it's like they gave him a, a little like nickname, but it even in the the opening credits where they kind of like, card everyone and, and and show you like what they're about and what their names are, it does say like Jason Mewes, actor playing himself. He's yes. he's out. His life expectancy is he's already past what everyone thought. <laughs> <laughs> right, and uh, he's the only one that has a real name. Right, right. No one else even has a name in this movie. Right, and some of them have monikers that change, too. Like, right. <laughs> it's, it's great. And then uh, I would be remiss not to bring up basically the, the, the harbinger of my puberty, and that is Krista Allen. I like it so far. Mm -hmm. Everybody's been real nice. Well, that's because you have big jugs. I mean, your boobs are huge. I mean, I want to squeeze them. <sighs> Mama. I was a young teenager around the time where Liar Liar came out and Emmanuel in Space came out. And Krista Allen was a big part of my adolescence, so I really appreciate that she got a lot to do in this movie. Yeah, she did, and I was not familiar with her. Granted, I'm sure I saw her in Liar Liar, but that's not a movie I ever revisited. So I haven't seen it since the early 2000s or whenever it came out. Uh, so I kind of forgotten all about it. The other, I guess, heroine in this is Jenny Wade as Honey Pie. She was pretty good, and she would also kind of go on to be the front woman of uh, the two sequels, the two subsequent sequels. Oh, really? Sloppy Seconds and The Happy Ending. So you could tell, just <laughs> class, class, class. <laughs> 100 <laughs> percent i'm gonna ask you what this film's about but first i mean it, it's as simple as really coleman what if the roadkill you hit on the nevada highway came back and found you later yeah yeah i mean that's what the movie's about <laughs> Are you hit roadkill and uh it turns out to be a monster and it has a monster family they've got some alien tendencies let's say Oof. They wear animal bones and hides and all kinds of stuff. And they really just want to fuck shit up. Uh, fuck shit. Uh, full stop. What sets this movie apart from a lot of other films? Back in the, the slasher films of the 70s and 80s, you had Jason, film, like a Friday the 13th film. One of its support beams that made it a Friday the 13th film is that you had co-eds showing some boobs, right? This film kind of spins that on its head in a and just like warps it in the most grotesque way because it's just like it dares to ask the question, what if the monster wants your ass, right? Like in the most... <laughs> <laughs> literal and every way possible these beasts are not just eating your children which they do but yes. they're also 
after your booty. Oh, man, I must have missed that part. They're out of the booty hole? After the booty hole? <laughs> like the, the peoples. <laughs> I know right. they're after each other's. Right. Well, you, I mean, so, you didn't you didn't see the part where the 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 biker lady with her leg cut off, like the the little baby alien that just was born straight up rotes her, <laughs> and then they no. blow her up. I missed that, and and one of the things with this movie is the cuts are so fast mm. i'm sure because they're including stuff like that it's really easy to miss small details okay okay it, it was uh i i wish i i missed that detail <laughs> <laughs> because full-on fellatio interspecies fellatio <laughs> with a money shot and then murder it was just so much I think that you did see it. You just literally blocked it out because I blocked it out. <laughs> yeah. I just I I have to unsee that. I can't remember it. <laughs> well, you know you you know you're in for a treat when the 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 first little baby alien comes in, ca causes some shit, starts chopping off limbs, and then takes a break to dry hump the moose head on the wall. <laughs> I did catch that. It's a special the, kind the of film of the moose, and it is a special kind of film when uh, the monsters are getting it on doggy style yeah. and make a new baby right there on the spot after consuming their first baby. Exactly. This film has it all. Why it didn't win all the Academy Awards? <laughs> it's absolutely. I don't know. I will never know. <sighs> oh. By the way, spoilers, everybody. I'm really sorry. If you haven't seen this masterpiece yet, and we're ruining it for you, oh god! But spoilers throughout this. You're welcome, actually, uh, because we're we're saving you from what. And I mean, okay, you know, I'm saying that, but did I not? Was I not entertained? Right? Were you not entertained by this shit? Oh, a hundred percent. It is balls to the wall. No pun intended. Uh, all the puns intended. Uh, for a good part of it. Unfortunately, in the middle, I think the second act kind of stops because I don't know if they it's not like they ran out of money, but they ran out of ideas. I think it's just like and even Henry Rollins's character, the coach comments on it. He's just like, we're at the point of a movie where there hasn't been a death in a while. And it's it's the opportune time. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, yes, yeah. <laughs> it was very self-aware. Yeah. Of what they were making. I will say I was real glad when Henry Rollins died. Spoiler alert. I know okay. that I know they built it that way, you know, so everyone would be happy because he was such just a, an annoying prick oh. throughout the movie. Yeah, yeah. Like thinking that he was in charge and talking about things he didn't know about and all that stuff. He was the Tony Robbins, um, right? Like he was the fake ass motivational speaker. Right, for sure. Uh, the poor man's Tony Robbins. Yeah. I actually was kind of pissed off the way he goes out because it just doesn't make any sense. It's just like he goes out, he does, he, he has that like uh, redeeming moment where he's going to, you know, go put himself on the line. And then he's just yelling bullshit and gets his head smashed against the wall. And I'm just like, what does that even mean? Well, he did say the world's going to remember me as a hero beforehand. So I'm still hoping that he fucking dies at that point. Yeah. No, no, no. A hundred percent. There was no way that he was going to make it out. But just why yell bullshit randomly? It was just a weird choice. Because he was no longer going to be remembered as a hero. Oh. Ah. Now he's just going to be remembered as a battering ram. Yeah, because he literally died off a, you know, exit ramp bar in mm -hmm. you know, Nevada. So, yeah, okay, I guess. Let's start it from the beginning. It's, it, it's very unoriginal like i said you've seen this movie before this is demon knight this is assault on precinct 13 this is a tower defense movie and for those of you that don't know what that is it, it's just essentially a ragtag group of characters that are usually tropes and parodies of other tropes and this is that to the nth degree trying to survive the night from dust till dawn 
you've seen this movie a million times. It tries to switch that formula up by being super self-aware. Right. Did you did you find that was what set it apart and did you, and did you like that aspect of it? I did. I really appreciated that aspect of it because they made such a ridiculous movie. Like the fact that they brought the awareness to the fact that their movie was just absolutely ridiculous. I thought that was great. I thought it played very well, starting out with the characters with no names. Yeah. And, you know, they they have the hero come in and they're like, here's the hero. And then he starts saying his badass line and then, you know, gets his head eaten off immediately. Right. I'm the guy that's going to save your ass. Um, I really appreciated that. Mm. And I think that if this was presented as a less self-aware movie, if it was presented in a more serious light, I would be coming into this review with, with a very different opinion of it. They're introducing each character like the first Suicide Squad, where they're just like, this is this person, this is their nickname, this is what they're known for, I guess. Basically, their their trope. And then each character is giving a, a life expectancy. And that's that's super cute, because more often than not, it gets it wrong on purpose. Because at one point, it even says, like, Clue Gallagher's character, who's the bartender, it's like, this man's going to die in 70 minutes. Grizzly fate. Right. And, I, and I was yeah. like, oh, cool. And I actually played the timestamp. He does, although it's a, it's a false death because he's in the, the subsequent sequels. That's the most realistic part of it, where it's just like that 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 old man, he's like outliving everyone, and you're just like, really? The old guy's going to gonna pull through? But then when shit hits the fan, it's so much stress that he has a heart attack in real time. <laughs> <laughs> you having a fucking heart attack? <laughs> I will say the first death that I cheered at was the first death, which was the hero. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm like, oh, yeah, sweet. Gave a preview into how this movie was going to go. Like, he just got his head cut, his head eaten off, and the wife comes in. Where's my husband? And he's dead. Right. I love it. And, and they actually wipe out the, the, the alphas first, which I appreciate. Yeah. Because they get rid of him. He's, he's your ash you know, from the Evil Dead character, he's 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 the person. He even says that if you want to live, I'm the guy that's gonna save your ass. Right, exactly. And then just yeah. boom, dead. And then the next one to get it is the army vet. You know, right. he, where he would be very probably, you know, strategically uh, important in a situation like this. Nope, gets just gets gut punched like right away. And then the yeah. kid gets it because, and, and then you know, his title card is like life expectancy, a long and full life. No, nope. oh, yeah. and he only dies because his mom makes a bad choice. Like, it <laughs> is it, no, but it, it like it gives itself a, a self aware callback to his character card because it says he will live a long and and, and prosperous life or whatever because he could fit into small spaces. Initial wave of monsters happen, and then yeah. she's just like, "Oh my god, my son!" And it's just like. Okay, it's not like a, a real world bad decision because as a parent, of course, you want to get to where your child is, right? But she goes upstairs, runs up there as fast as she can, pulls him out of not only where she thought she left him, but a different crawl space where he never would have got found. Never would have got found. Right. He just came out. I'm like, Mom? Yeah. And then puts him next to a fucking window. <laughs> right. And it's like, I will never let you go. I'll never let you go. Yeah. And then he gets ripped out the window and gets eaten. And I was cheering so hard. When that oh happened. my God. I, I hate, <laughs> I hate seeing kids die in horror movies. This one was such a good way to handle that. And such a good plot device because that literally sets up her arc because, right. Oh my God. What a cool character she becomes. <laughs> Those things are going to, It's fucked up, but she's literally forged in the fires in 30 minutes because right. she goes from downtrodden, desperate mom that turns to just whoring herself out to this douchebag that like mm -hmm. runs a bar in nowhere. Boss hog. Boss hog to uh, losing her child in a gruesome way to now 
taking up the mantle of the heroine. It's just right. so cool. <laughs> yeah, and at some point she goes into hair and makeup. Right. And I'm, I'm not sure where. <laughs> Somewhere halfway halfway through the movie, she finds the time to go into hair yeah. and makeup and come back out like I don't three times more gorgeous than when she started the movie. Krista Allen is hair and makeup, Coleman. You take that. Back. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she just like is totally remade. Right. Yeah. Well, <laughs> from the beginning of the movie. And yes, of course, she like goes through the character arc, but it's not like Terminator. Sarah Connor. Sarah Connor looks like shit the whole time. Mm -hmm. It's this is a heroine that, you know, isn't the heroine at first. And then when it's when she, once she becomes the heroine, she's like a completely different person physically. Yeah. Within, I don't know, an hour or two from when the movie yeah. started. <laughs> yeah. She gets the Farrah Fawcett do. She gets a little bit cleaned up. Yeah, no, 100%. And she's not even the one that gets, like, just money shotted with gore and then, like, literally does the gratuitous scene. Although, I will say, for a movie that features, I want to say bestiality, but there has to be some kind of ality for, for alien on human sex, which is what this movie is. It's devoid of any areola or anything, really. Like, it's... You you get... Monster cock. You get monster cock. You get yeah. her face kind of like a pudding pie or pumpkin pie or whatever her name is. She strips down and then, like, immediately, like, demasculates the other guy. She, Act like you had some. And then you have Henry Rollins getting his pants ripped off. So there was a little <laughs> bit in there for everybody. <laughs> and then wearing pink sweats through the rest while he made all these uh, <laughs> profound... <laughs> statements about aliens and humans and all these things you knew nothing about yeah i will say have a little more appreciation for henry rollins after this movie and the beef i've had with henry rollins previously is he's just one of those guys that he just feels like he takes himself so seriously and he's always kind of felt like that to me and so i kind of gained a slight appreciation uh from this movie just because He's obviously able to poke a little bit of fun at himself and his image and everything. So I liked him a little more after the movie. This is not a vanity piece whatsoever. No. <laughs> <laughs> I have actually seen him live and all that. You know, paid money to see this Indeed. man talk. So I know that's his brand of is self-deprecation. He is the most, like, I am the biggest dweeb. And my sister even dumped him, like, in real life. Like, she went on right. a couple dates with him and then, you know, kicked him to the curb because he was just a weird straight-edge kid in the punk rock scene back in the day. But I knew that this was more on par of what a Henry Rollins role looks like because he doesn't, although he projects that, like, uber masculine macho i'm screaming at you and i'm flexing my muscles in every single rollins video that came out in the 90s his acting roles are always some kind of weird comedy so i, I thought this was great another role i really liked balthazar getty in this oh what do you mean oh he was enjoyable and he was still i mean it's another one of those things about this movie that was a lot of fun. The hero dies in the end. The prick is still a prick at the end, but he makes it. Yeah. Outside of his like last line in the movie, he's he's kind of a prick throughout. He's a prick with so, a heart. Yes, true. There's there's a heart throughout, but he's still an asshole the whole time. Uh, and you're kind of cheering at the end when when he makes it through, even though he's he's such a tick. Yeah. But. All the other people, it's just uh, uh, overblown movie tropes, like each of these characters that they play. So you're just like, man, I hope you die. Yeah. I, and, and you know they're going to. I was an instant fan after this. After the credits rolled, I was just like, give me more of Judah Friedlander. Because he's just the guy that's melting in real time. <laughs> <laughs> just eaten by maggots. I mean, fuck, man. They put this dude through the ringer filming this film, and he was so game. He just looked like he was in it, into it, right? Like, he just oh, loved yeah. every bit of it. It was like a jackass moment. It was like, insert <laughs> Steve-O in a, in a serious, in a serious, in, in a actual film, and it's just like, how much shit can we put him through? All right, well, we're just going to keep giving him screen time until he says no. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, if you if you or I were to get in a movie like this, we'd be doing the same thing. Yeah. And I was going to ask you, like, who do you think 
think gave the best performance of the movie? Whose performance did you enjoy the most in this movie? I would say who, uh, I, I would say Balthazar Getty probably, because okay. he is a unsuspecting, like leading person in this. <laughs> And it's a very different role from everything else he's done. But I have to say, who surprised me the most, and you're probably going to roll your eyes, but I think Krista Allen surprised me the most because knowing what she is known for and what she has done in the past, and then her having to really give every paint with all the colors of emotion during this, I think she steps up to the plate really well. Um, what did you think? Judah Friedlander. Oh, well, yeah. <laughs> <I> <laughs> hey, hey. Uh, hey, what about the basement hatch door? Best, best performance, I don't know. In a movie like this, it's hard to say who the best performance is because everything's so ridiculous. But I enjoyed his the most. And there was, like, parts of his that didn't even make sense and didn't go anywhere. <laughs> yeah. Like, he got puked, I don't know, acid on? Something. And then suddenly he's just covered in maggots. But they're <laughs> never-ending maggots coming from nowhere. <laughs> yeah. There's just nonstop maggots all over his hair. Yeah. And they wash him out. And then there's more maggots. And then his eye gets ripped out. And there's maggots in his eye hole. <laughs> <laughs> A lot of fun watching him throughout just digress. And at the end, like, does anyone have any lip balm? Yeah. <laughs> his body is melting. And there's one point where things are crawling through his skin. Yeah. That's never explained that I could tell. God, I was, was waiting some... for that scene where something just popped out of his face. Right. Right. Let's talk about the creatures real quick. Because right. if I'm going to be honest, I thought they were derpy as fuck until... They finally broke through, and then I'm like, oh, my God. It's just, like, this, like, hulky, like, thing with a cow's skull on it. And then it rips that off and reveals what it really looks like. I'm like, oh, man, this is awesome. Like, it's alien venom. Kind of, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, I mean, it's just thinking zero CGI. Everything okay. is practical. It's either makeup, prosthetics, or puppets. And once it kind of, like, again, movie's kind of self-aware, once it literally rips off this stupid-looking hulking costume, it just looks really cool. Like, I, I was into it. Like I just said, Alien Venom is the best way I can think to describe it because it does very much have alien, like from the Alien movies features, and then it's got all the crazy teeth of Venom yeah. basically in the giant mouth. So it's kind of a cross between the two. But yeah, it was pretty cool looking. Takes a lot to kill it. You got to knock a lot of its teeth out before you punch down its throat and rip its guts out. What but a what a death! What a fatality! <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> She's like choke on it. I was like, "Oh my god." Like she literally deep throats the thing to death. And I mean, yeah. if we're all going to be pervs, she's she outperved the <laughs> the pervs, right? <laughs> Finish him. <laughs> <laughs> and she did. And she she did. <laughs> like the aliens really, yeah, they're I mean, they're the MacGuffin, right? But they really go through it. Like, like you said, one gets its dick like chopped off in a door. The other one gets deep-throated to death. It's just like, <laughs> kind of felt bad for the aliens. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't feel bad for any species that can just get it on and make another one right then and there right. on the spot. Yeah. They're not doing too bad. There's a lot of movie convenience, uh, like plot convenience in this film, where it's just like something would happen and then... The movie recognizes, okay, we've played with house money too much. There's too much of a lull, so we have to progress. So, like, big boss man that's just laying on the floor like a fucking idiot, he gets punched through the through the wall. So, it's just like the aliens got to pick and choose when they were strong enough to rip through walls and doors. 
right? Right. To kill off the characters. That yeah. It was time to kill them off. That was kind of dumb to me because it's like, can you or can't you? And in the fact that it it just slow rolled it so bad, kind of took me out of it a little bit. But it just might be me being a snob. Yeah, probably you being a snob. Sure, uh, <laughs> but I I see what you're saying. Just in a movie like this, I didn't care. Okay. I, again, because everything was so ridiculous and so self aware throughout most of the movie that. Like my attention wasn't brought to that fact. Mm -hmm. You know, I was excited when Big Boss Man finally died. There was a couple times when I'm going, if they can just punch through walls whenever they want, like why are they stacking all this shit in front of the doors? And yeah. what good is that doing? But I mean, a line of dialogue. Oh well, in this room they'd yeah. have to have crowbars to get through, but upstairs they can get through however they want. <sighs> Uh, this whole movie is summed up as a line of dialogue, right? <laughs> everything is convenient, everything, or or when, when it's not convenient or whatever. We're going to jump to the end. Credits rolled, and I was mm -hmm. sitting there, and I was so disappointed in myself for going, that was a fucking thrill ride. That was so, <laughs> I had so much fun, and immediately, I knew there was two other films, and I'm just like, I, I, I had to go to the second one. <laughs> I made it <laughs> I made it three minutes <laughs> into the second one and then I I threw in the towel and I and, and it's funny too because John Gulliger directed both the next two films it was written by the same people right. directed by the same person the only difference was money <laughs> it was so fast and evident that this man should never get a camera unless you're like pumping him full of cash. And then, like, later on, it was just like, oh, you know, he would say on, on uh, interviews, he's like, it was such a great experience going on Project Greenlight, and and they allowed me to live my dream and make my movie. And then later on, when shit went sour, when when the second and third film were so horrible, he he went on and he blasted everything. He's like, it was like the nanny state. Uh, when I was filming the first one, I, Project Greenlight people were, were constantly filming me and, and asking questions and this and that, and I couldn't do my thing. It's just like, listen, bitch, you are so lucky. <laughs> like, <laughs> because look what you did after. It's just such a travesty. I never want to hear what this guy has to say besides being funded by Ben Affleck and Matt Damon. There are worse because of the lack of money and the lack of supervision, basically. Coleman, let's just say that there's... <laughs> <laughs> let's just say, hypothetically, but not really, because this actually happened in the, in the third movie, that it ends on a giant robot... We gotta repopulate the Earth. That's what we gotta do. We gotta start fucking. Right now. <laughs> Let's just throw that out there. That's the direction that this film franchise goes in. <laughs> do film franchises like this get better? They never do. No. They always get more ridiculous. Outside yeah. of, I never saw House 1, but I'm going to bet House 2 was better. It was different. But yeah, yeah. No, totally. <laughs> I, no, I, I'm totally picking up what you're putting down. It is the From Dust Till Dawn syndrome, right? It's like... Yeah, you could throw Bruce Campbell in a From Dust Till Dawn, but it's still going to be a bullshit attempt at, at, at just a cash grab off the name. Anything that came out afterwards, f uh, after From Dust Till Dawn, was just bullshit. Straight to TV, sci-fi channel garbage. And th this was not even that. This was, it, it belonged on a college like film school project thing. This guy fucking locked in to this, got to make his film. Hopefully he got some of that $658,000 and he's retiring. Cause I think that this film is great. It's a good addition to the horror zeitgeist that, you know, cult film, whatever, he did the same bullshit. He was unoriginal, but he added horny aliens, which was kind of fun. 
we don't need to hear anything else from him. Yeah. Uh, and the closest thing I could think to compare it to, because I'm not a real horror fan. Uh, I usually watch them for the show. <laughs> but it was never a genre I got into. It reminded me of a shittier, like, Cabin in the Woods. Yeah, just in right. Cabin in the Woods was kind of self-aware to the point that they, like, show you the people in the room doing all the stuff and making the horror happen in the midst of the movie and, you know, placing bets on it. So right. it, for me, for, for my limited knowledge, it kind of, I got that feeling of it just from the, the awareness of the movie that was being made. The question of the night is, though, not being a horror person, is this a movie that you would recommend to other people to watch? Uh, yeah, people with small children. <laughs> looking for a family film. Yeah. Um, trying to discipline their children uh, is probably good so that you get about 30 minutes of the movie and say, yeah. you know, if you're bad, that's what's going to happen to you. The right. monster is going to come out and fucking yeah. eat you. <laughs> Your mom's going to get you killed. No, in all seriousness, would you, did you like the film? I enjoyed it. Good. I, it's not a movie that I think would be for everyone. Yeah. It's a movie I might try on everyone. Like, you know, enjoying the film, I may be like, hey, you got to watch this just to see what their reaction is and, and you know, to be able to tell if they're cool or not. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it's going to be for everybody, right. but I think that people that can appreciate, as we've stated many times, the self-awareness and a humor in this movie you know, it's one of those movies, if anyone goes into it and they're expecting a serious horror movie, they're going to be extremely disappointed. So, yes, it's it's totally schizophrenic. It toes the line of trying to do the army of darkness thing where you see something gruesome and then the little baby alien is is face fucking a, a moose head on the wall. <laughs> It's not as it's not as nuanced as as a Sam Raimi, you know, Army of Darkness or you know, Evil Dead Two type type deal, but it it is it is funny. Like I was laughing, I was laughing in some of the more horrific moments, like like you seeing child murder, right? Like, <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, just point that out, John. It's just fun. I I I, I haven't like <laughs> sat there and watched a film that I haven't seen and and gone like yeah or like you know cheered in real time in a while and I feel real dumb for doing it. So I don't really recommend it on like <laughs> Twitter. Like if someone would be like, what's the best, you know, top 10 uh, horror movies, even tower defense movies or you know whatever, this probably wouldn't make my list because this falls deeply into the guilty pleasure category. But this is like top guilty pleasure for me. Like it is so trashy, so dumb, but also competent enough to where I don't want to just turn it off. It's just so uh, yeah. weird. I would, I would, and this is, I think, something we've talked about a lot. I would make this a date night movie. I would make <laughs> this like, I would make this like a first to third date night movie. Yeah. To see how they reacted to it. It, it's a great way to check if they're in or out, right? And if they're in, you're breaking up with them. <laughs> you don't you don't want to procreate with someone that likes this film. That's our thoughts on Feast. This is our spooky ist of films. Uh, this is our Halloween episode, uh, essentially, of the Cult of Film. Mr. Coleman Yeti, uh, where can everyone find you? At Coleman Yeti on Instagram and Twitter. And you can also find me occasionally on the channel Cascade Backcountry, doing all crazy, all kinds of crazy outdoor adventures uh, with a friend of mine. I am at John the Host on the Bird site. You can follow me at John the Host. You could also follow this very podcast at The Cult of Films. You could listen to this on all your favorite podcasting sites like iTunes and Spotify. And those are the two, right? Like, it's everywhere else, but those are the two that we need to mention. Uh, leave us little baby aliens. Leave us some, I don't know, interspecies semen to, to just <laughs> throw in a Petri dish and see what happens. We, we want to... Yeah. This just is a very it to us. Yeah, it, it, we're, we believe in evolution. And, you know, if, if that's what's next, then that's what's next. 
this episode does need to come to a close. So uh, happy Halloween. Check your candy before giving it to your children, and we will see you next time.